It's actually been remarkably good. It's an, been an absolute privilege to listen to a new way of engagement between the United States and Africa. I'm hearing words like partnership, which I haven't heard before in the, in the context of, uh, of trade and economic relationships between US and, and Africa. You know, we're dealing with a new Africa and it, it sounds like the Biden administration, first of all, understands that and second of all, is playing to that, which is very refreshing. What, what are your expectations and possible takeaways based on what you have seen so far? I think that the, the US-Africa relationship over many years has been somewhat problematic. Now, the US has been very much absent in, in the African environment and part of the reason for that is that there's this perception in the United States that Africa is uninvestable, that the continent is complex, that it's difficult, that it's corrupt, that it's uh, um, a highly problematic place for investment and as a result the US has been absent. During the Trump administration there was a realization that China had stolen the march and was way ahead of America on the African continent. And there were some kind of ham-fisted attempts to, to, to correct that, but pretty much using bullying tactics. It was approach of a, a, a case of the United States going to, to, to African governments and saying, if you're with the Chinese, then you're not with us. The Chinese have done a huge amount to grow and develop the continent, whether we like it or not. But they did so because the US was absent. Now, the, the Biden administration seems to be realizing that. They seem to be addressing that and they seem to be looking at investment in Africa, not just trade. And that's what we need to change the, the dynamic of the relationship, number one. And number two, to significantly increase um, the benefits for the United States in Africa and the benefits for Africa from the United States. We mustn't forget that by 2050, Africa is going to have the biggest youth population of any continent in the world. That is going to give the United States a huge consumer market. It's also going to become a very, very important labor pool for, for the next generation of industrialization. So how can America effectively and tangibly compete in economically engaging all the places? In the 80s, the Chinese were well behind. Mm -hmm. They were doing less than $12 billion of trade. Today they're doing $256 billion of trade with Africa. Now that puts America way behind the curve. But part of the secret to the success of the Chinese engagement with Africa has been an investment strategy. A strategy to build infrastructure, to, to, to grow the economies of the countries in which they're operating in. I'm hearing for the first time that kind of language coming out of the United States. And it is going to be through partnerships through investment and through collaborative engagement that America is going to be able to pick up and, and, and compete. It's not going to be easy and it's going to need to be centrally government-led. One of the biggest advantages that the Chinese and the Russians have got in Africa is that their strategy is led by government. And the American government and the White House specifically needs to make Africa a strategic priority for the future. The American economy is going to grow based on energy transition and all of the enablers for, the, for energy transition come out of Africa and for that reason this relationship today is not optional. It has to happen and it has to happen quickly. All right, so I thought recently your foundation came up with a survey that showed that um, Wi-Fi penetration in Africa is what do you think the American private sector can do to help address this very difficult challenge? Very interestingly, when we approached the youth, when we approached this demographic and asked them what they considered to be basic human rights, they didn't see water as a basic human right or access to water. They didn't see access to electricity as a basic human right, but they saw access to data cost-effective data as a fundamental basic human right. And they indicated that, that it's one of the things that they would take to the streets to ensure that, that they had access to. Now this is an area that the United States can play a huge role in. Most of the telecommunications infrastructure in Africa today is, is of Chinese origin. Um, the, the mobile operators have made out like bandits on the continent and there is an opportunity to leapfrog this technology as only the United States can to give 
connectivity and data to the next generation of Africans. And with that, we will absolutely ensure that this is a generation that will be able to play in the international community without leaving home. And this is very important because most young Africans see themselves as global citizens. They are connected to youth elsewhere in the world. And they are saying that if they can't get opportunities at home, they will migrate to get those opportunities. Mm. So the biggest value add that the United States can give to Africa today is to help create and democratize access to data and access to the connectivity that is going to give young Africans the opportunities they need and keep them at home. Mm. I was the African Union uh, has been granted President Biden's endorsement to ascend to the G20. It's this timely, uh, taking place in the direct wake of the tremendous potential being realized from the forming of the African Continental Free Trade Area or AF, uh, AFCFTA and how does Africa's next generation envision its potential to forge autonomous economic growth? The G20 has become the organization that looks after the interests of the globe. Mm -hmm. Africa represents a huge part of our landmass and will represent the biggest body of population. There is no way that the world can take decisions about our collective future without involving Africa. Mm -hmm. The mere fact that the European Union is, is on the G20 automatically should entitle Africa to be on the G20. So President Biden's initiative is, is timely, it's very much welcome. Mm -hmm. It might be a little late, but better late than never. And I think that it is a very, very important initiative. Africa is, is, is the biggest carbon sink for the world. Mm -hmm. It is, however, the continent that benefits the least from, from global carbon, uh, the global carbon economy. Huge pressure is placed on African governments to keep that carbon sink in place. In order to do so, we have to restrict growth and development in these countries. It is essential that the carbon economy contributes to African governments to compensate them for the challenges to growth and development that keeping these carbon sinks in place is causing. Mm -hmm. and, and ascension to the G20 and giving Africa a meaningful voice in the, in the entire, in the global community is going to allow us to fight for those for those rights. So Ivo, with infectious disease, one of the most uh, challenging threats according to a study by uh, your organization, what do you expect the US Africa Leadership Summit agenda regarding military preparedness and security? So this is very interesting. In the first edition of the survey, which was a year pre-COVID, African youth identified infectious diseases as one of the biggest threats to the growth and development of the economy. Africans have been dealing with dreaded disease for decades. And it's probably why Africa as a continent came out of the COVID crisis as well as it did. Now, infectious disease is a massive security threat to everybody on the continent. But if you couple that with the reality of fundamentalist insurgency which is emerging on the continent, these two, these two issues have to be treated as if they are a wartime situation. Mm. Now dealing with, with dreaded disease and infectious disease is, is underway. There's engagement with African governments are engaging with the pharmaceutical companies, the American government are making huge contributions to the eradication of things like AIDS and Ebola and stuff's being done about that. Mm. But the physical security threat that is now emerging because of fundamentalist activity in Africa most of which is targeted at the West, not targeted at Africa, has got to be dealt with as a matter of urgency. 25% of the youth that we polled had either been approached themselves by fundamentalist organizations to participate in terrorist activity or knew somebody that had. That's an alarming figure and this is right across the continent. So African governments need to be enabled to deal with these threats. 
putting American troops on the ground or European troops on the ground is not going to work. African governments themselves need to be encouraged, enabled and facilitated to create defence capability of their own. And only then will these fundamentalist issues be dealt with. Deal with the issue of dreaded disease, deal with the security threats, and immediately you've got a great foundation to grow these democracies. Mm. I, I will, before we go, the, this summit takes place over the hills, or on the hills of what some people described as uneventful COP27. However, one that was held on the African continent in Egypt, to be precise, uh, that Africa contributes less to the pollution of um, uh, of the pollution of the environment. But what are the views of Africa's young people on this dichotomy forming the world's next green industrialists? So, again, the findings on 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 climate change were really interesting. In the first edition of the survey, most of the African youth did not see climate change as an issue that affected them at all. It didn't even come onto the agenda. Two years later, climate change was identified as a major, major threat. Why? Because suddenly this was a population that had come into contact with severe drought, severe flooding, crops that had been destroyed. And, and, and now the African youth is very engaged with issues of climate change. And in fact, climate change activists are starting to emerge from within this population that didn't know that climate change was their issue right. two years ago. So COP in Egypt was an important milestone because it brought the whole debate right onto African soil. Not enough happened in that process. But I think that you'll find in further, in future engagements, Africans will become much more engaged and much more determined to ensure that they are not on the losing end of all of the initiatives that are being undertaken in the world to deal with climate change. And it is a real, real challenge because it is Africa that's suffering the most, despite the fact that we're emitting the least. Thank you very much, Ivan. Well. Great talking to you. Thank you.